Welcome back to this month's round table. It's our end of the year show. It is December. The holidays are around the corner. As always, I'm Andreas Sunny, your host for the Craft Brewery Round Table. You're all in one comprehensive view of what's happening across the real estate industry, straight from some of the industry's earliest technology adopters, foremost experts in technology, brokerage, government policy, marketing, capital construction, and cybersecurity. As always, we have a three-part show for you. Part one, introductions, what sectors, what's happening for each of us in our respective places in the industry. Part two, we unpack and dive deep into the biggest trends, biggest shifts occurring. And part three, what's the one thing from each of us to you, our listeners, who we couldn't do this without? By the way, 76th episode, 3,000 tune-ins or downloads a month, four years in running, loving it, where we're going to give you that competitive edge. So I'm Andreas Sunny, founder, host, brokerage owner, and technology growth strategist for the nonprofit, for-profit sectors. And joining me this month and every month, I hope, going into the next year, Saul Klein, realtor emeritus, data advocate, futurist, and the original real estate internet evangelist, freshly back from Paris. Saul, nice to see you. Welcome back. Great to be back. Yeah, state side is the best side, right? <laughs> I enjoy it. Yeah. Also joining us. Rebecca Carlson, founder, CEO, of Carlson Integrated, past president, of Nightcar, brokerage owner, all things marketing. Becca, nice to see you. Welcome. And Dan Wagner, SVP, government relations, all thing regu- all things regulation at Inland Real Estate Group of Companies. And I can't read the symbol. What's the symbol say on that cup there? Real is that a realtor cup? It's a Santa Claus. It's Santa Claus's uh, bottom part of his body. Well, oh, well, then I'm not doing that. <laughs> well, welcome back. <laughs> and ha- Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy holidays to everyone out there, our listeners, uh, those that tune in. What a great, it's my favorite time of year, uh, bar none, except I'm super busy. How are things on your end, Saul? I know you're back, and we've got Santa's bottom down there on the left with Dan. But let's start with you, Saul. You're to my right. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm busy. You know, anytime you leave town and you got to catch up, and uh, so we started. It seems since the last show we had at the NAR um, convention, the Expo in Anaheim, and I got to meet Dan face to face, and we had a, a great time uh, sitting around talking to with the NAR uh, a tax advocate, and uh, so that was great. And then I had to leave town here last week to go to Paris for the inaugural. Uh, MLS uh, International Forum. That's really interesting. You know, we've got MLS. We're trying to destroy MLS here in this country, and we really kind of take it for granted. And here, the rest of the world, they're just kind of trying to figure out how to get MLS. And uh, so that was interesting. And my market in San Diego is probably like most markets, at least most major markets in the United States. There's not enough inventory. Um, The interest rates don't help any. And we're not building any more real estate. And so we're kind of waiting for interest rates to drop so the market can go crazy again. Which they will, inevitably. Right? Yeah. It's, like, it's cyclical. <clears throat> and how are things in uh, Chicago? There, Dan and Becca. Nice to see you both. Go ahead, Becca. Uh, things are great. We're in full holiday party swing. Uh, I've seen Anna Maria twice in the past two weeks. I'm, we certainly miss her tonight, but I've gotten to actually catch up with her in person, which is lovely as we uh, kind of keep moving forward with business. It's not business as usual. Transaction volume is down considerably. Deals are taking longer as everyone is acclimated with, I'm certain. But I feel what I'm feeling in the marketplace is, is still a positive sentiment. Like nobody's concerned or, or despondent. We've seen this before. We've been through many cycles and holding hands a little bit with the younger or newer brokers who haven't gone through a cycle uh, to make sure that they know that this is normal and it's okay. It's time to come to work, but it sounds like both of you need to move to Connecticut because we're busy. <laughs> Dan, you Becca, feel what, the same? Becca, what's Becca. your ribbon you're wearing? So my ribbon that I'm wearing is to support Israel and uh, the return of the hostages. So until every hostage is home, I will be wearing a blue ribbon every single day. Oh, God bless you. You Blue ribbons for Israel.org. God bless you. You're amazing. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I am a Christmas guy. I have my Christmas socks, my Christmas coffee mug. Um, I'm Clark Griswold. I have 
18 hours I worked to put my Christmas lights on my house. And uh, I'm in full Christmas tilt right now. So it's all going good. Um, go ahead, Andre. Well, I was going to say, last year you had a, a Santa tie. So uh, you're clearly more comfortable now. It's a year <laughs> later and you came with Santa's behind. You know, it was one of these things that it's a new era of trying to be cool by not wearing a tie. That's I want to be like Saul um, <laughs> and you. Oh, uh, well, thank I had a tie on yesterday. I had to take it off today. It was, it was a brutal day. Well, well, thank you. Saul and I uh, did bond. We were in, um, and Becca, you were in Anaheim too, weren't you? I didn't make it this year, unfortunately. I would have found you. Don't worry. <laughs> well, um, Inland uh, Real Estate hosted the commercial cocktail party, which was fun. And I hosted Saul and Evan Lydiard, who's this, the director of tax, uh, all things tax over at um, for breakfast. And Saul is actually uh, better looking in person than he is on the screen. Um, <laughs> but we, we had a very good time and I look forward to talking about what we learned in Anaheim. And um, so take it away, Andreas. Well, no, obviously you both, I mean, outside of Connecticut being busy where there's opportunities just on the horizon, more brokers that are out there ready, willing to work. Uh, there's always young, hungry, newer companies. Companies are their own economies. They have to get bigger and smaller. You just have to be out there in front of them to take the business. And, you know, in some instances, willing to take deal size and deal type of different caliber, right? right. Um, so we're branching out into the areas that there's opportunity and we're, we're happier for it, or at least we will be after the holidays because I, like you, am, am all Christmas, all holiday season. I don't decorate as well as you, but I haven't <laughs> been doing it as long in the same place. And, uh, but it's and my two neighbors each have 80 foot trees lit all the way wow. down the top. So I can't I can't really compete with that. <laughs> At least not 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 outside. Inside it's great. But it's it's just been a, it's been a blessing all year. As I said, the show's take done great. The team, the division, brokerage is busy, everyone's busy. And now it's time to spend time with family. So I'm just very excited. I want to hear more about Anaheim. I want to hear more about Paris. Seems like every deal I get into now, everyone's talking more about buyer broker compensation, even commercially, which is interesting. We've been dealing with it forever. Uh, but I'll leave that to you guys. You're fresh off the scene in your respective areas. What happened in Anaheim? Tell us more. Well, Saul, so, I mean, we, it was the talk of the town was everybody was talking about what's happening with uh, the wild world of the brokerage and the lawsuits. And I mean, that was on everybody's mind. And um, Saul, did you want to kind of go in? Because I, what was cool was Saul being there, um, he gave a big presentation about MLS, and Saul was on the, the, the cutting edge floor of making this stuff happen years and years ago. So I really, uh, the expert of experts, Saul, why don't you kind of go into uh, into this? Well, so it was it was really interesting because to me, <laughs> the first thing that kind of got my attention was that at every meeting they read a an antitrust disclaimer. And so every meeting we went to, and now this has been going on for a while, but this was real apparent because you're going from meeting to meeting all day long for a week. And so we started with an antitrust disclaimer every event. A lot of people expected that there would be a lot of conversation around the litigation itself, around the strategy of, of NAR. And the fact is, you guys know, you can't talk about those things when you're involved in litigation. So the intent was never uh, to talk about it. And of course, a lot of people were disappointed because they thought they were going to come and they were going to hear NAR tell them exactly why the cases were going the way they were going and what the what the remedies might be and what the direction might be. But that wasn't uh, what was spoken about at all. It was an update. Here's where we are. And here's some of the actions that are being taken, but nothing in great detail. And you're right. They the uh, Rodney Ganshaw asked me if I would. Uh, do a presentation, asked me about a week before the event, if I would do a history of MLS, because one of the things that we lose sight of is we've been through these things before, that we've had ups and downs in MLS as we've had antitrust lawsuits, we had the DOJ on our back. This is not new. And so if we're going to talk to people and give them some hope about where this thing might end up, we ought to just take them back and remind them of where we've come from and about even why we're where we are today. And that reason is we changed the rules of MLS in 1996 as a consumer to create a consumer advantage, a consumer benefit. 
And now we're being taken to task for the consumer benefit we created in 1996 through an offer of compensation. So another, I, it was interesting because, you know, when you go do an NAR event, you never know how many people are going to show up in the room. Now, in the old days, I was doing a NAR event at every NAR for a number of years. And so I knew we were going to fill the room because technology was brand new and nobody else was talking about it and everybody wanted to hear about it. But, you know, MLS, that's old hat. How many people are going to come to an MLS meeting, the MLS uh, policy meeting? It's policy. And uh, the room was set for over 1,200 people and all the seats were full and people were standing up in the back. So it really was interesting to see how many people were now interested in talking about hearing about MLS. And I got good feedback. Again, I had no solutions to offer, only where we had come from and, and uh, why in some cases we were where we are where we are today. But, you know, NAR is always fun. You know, it's you learn a lot. And I highly recommend going to uh, NAR meetings if you can afford to do so if you can take the time off from what you're doing because they're always fun you meet people you see old friends you reestablish relationships referral networks and what you learn is incredible and I recommend to my own association and MLS that they take staff to these meetings because there's no better way for the staff people to really get a feel for organized real estate than to go to these events so I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I always enjoy going to the NAR events. Any any chance you can to grow your network? It's that's the that's our industry. It's a team. It's a team sport and it's a contact sport. Outside of the marketing to get you in front of them, you got to be there, right? Or else you're not you're not front of mind, front and center. It doesn't happen. Go ahead. The other thing that I uh, I wanted to highlight too is that uh, you know the big one of the big elephants in the room is also is kind of the the controversy of. Um, some of the leadership issues at NAR, and uh, and I just have to give hats off to Tracy Casper, who's the um, was installed as the uh, as the president of NAR, and the leadership team to uh, to be able to move forward and bring people together to say, hey, we're uh, we're you know not going away, we're here, and we're working hard for the industry, and to remind everybody that if not for the National Association of Realtors standing in the breach many times legislatively at this national level, the state level, the local levels, uh, you'd have some really crazy legislation that would pass from zoning to, I mean, so many different things. And it's important for people to recognize the fact that the um, RPAC and everything that the, the, the organized, organized real estate does really has made a terrific impact in everyone's career. And these local associations are a big part of the reason why so many people are successful at, uh, at making money and, and doing their thing. So I think, um, I think it was nice to get back and to, uh, to, to be able to embrace the, the leadership and to recognize that um, while we might be under attack in different areas and, and in some areas, you know, we, mistakes were made and we have to acknowledge that, but we need to move forward knowing that our intentions uh, overall as an organization, um, having a, 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 our code, the realtor code of conduct, um, you know, we're, we're providing so much, so many great services. Our realtor brethren um, are doing great, helping people, helping customers that sometimes that gets lost in the mix. And, you know, people were, uh, you know, they, they're joking. They, they talk about um, our, the realtor commissions of, you know, boy, these are our high commissions. Well, um, Somebody said, well, I wonder what trial lawyers get a third of whatever the settlement is. So what kind of commission is that? I mean, so it's it's like the it's you damned if you do, damned if you don't. But um, but I feel good about the, the realtor model. I feel good about our organization and we have to stand strong and stand up for what we all believe in. And that's um, that's our realtor world. And I know that um, that a lot of other folks feel the same way. And. I'm proud of uh, of being a part of the National Association of Realtors and in all of our groups. I, I know um, another, another group that I'm a part of is the Realtors Land Institute and the Women's Council of Realtors. And all these groups provide a voice for for people in their particular area of expertise. And you know, the, 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 they provide leadership opportunities. They provide networking, like Saul was talking about. Um, 
I know, uh, you know, Becca, you're, you're, you're part of uh, NICAR. So, I mean, you guys do a lot of stuff too, right? Right. It's important to, uh, I loved, I actually think I wrote it down um, and I've written it down before Andreas's conversation about real estate being a contact sport. We all have to come together and there are so many careers and people impacted by every broker's job and role. When you think about like the, the sphere of influence of how great that is, who doesn't know a real estate broker? Anyone, like in the country. I can't, I can't imagine somebody not knowing a real estate broker. We are I mean, that. I know the commercial broker, call us. But anyways, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think real estate in particular is such a beautiful relationship business. The relationships that last decades and generations even that really provide opportunity to, there's a low barrier to entry. There's an opportunity to build a life and to come, you know, to cater to your marketplace or to grow into a new marketplace. There's so much vision and so much collaboration. It really is a fantastic industry. And I am glad to hear some of the feedback. And I heard a ton of fantastic feedback from my fellow board members who were at the NAR conference, just of how collaborative and conciliatory and how amazing and inspirational it was and continues to be and the important ways that NER works to protect consumers, to protect all of our spheres of influence, those, those rippling circles of everyone who's touched by real estate. You're absolutely right, Dan. It's critical and important and builds the economy of our country. It's, so it's you, uh, you remind you remind me of there's an old joke we used to tell in California where, uh, and when you're in real estate sales and, and a, a, a potential client would say to you, I have a friend in real estate. And of course, the, the, the response then, the joke, the response was, if you live in California and you don't know someone who has a real estate, like if you don't have a friend with a real estate license, then you don't have any friends. <laughs> also another reason to live in Connecticut. Right. There's a lot of people with real estate licenses. But and then another point is that real estate is a broad uh, career for people. It's not just real estate sales. And I hear people talk about it's not like and I say about it. This is not the National Association of Real Estate Salespeople. Oh, what do I need to learn that for? I sell real estate. Yeah, this is not the National Association of Real Estate Salespeople. Great this point. Is, this is the National Association of Realtors, people interested in real estate, not just people who sell residential real estate at, cert, at a certain moment in time, right? So it's a much bigger, well, I'm not any good at sales. Well, there's still lots of things you can do in real estate. I mean, lots of other categories that you can get involved in, in real estate beyond residential real estate sales. And what I used to say to people is actually, Resident and residential real estate sales is a great career, and in some cases, it's an entry level position. And what happens is that's where you get your foot in the door, and then you learn about all the other opportunities that are available to you in the quote real estate industry, and they go way beyond listing and selling real estate. And there, there are many, many different things you can do in real estate. Like marketing, for instance. Like marketing. <laughs> or, or development, capital fi financing the deals. And you're right, it's entry level. You come in and NAR gives you a path and a mentorship plan if you want it, if you need it. You well, and you have, the, you, you have IREM, the Institute of Real Estate Management. Um, that's a great, another great organization I belong to. So many affiliate organizations that are related to our real estate universe. Um, it's pretty exciting. And um, Saul, I know that you know some people have talked about how the um, the realtor world could be changed if you don't have to uh, belong to your local association to get um, MLS um, that you could just go directly to MLS and you've experienced that that uh, the world won't the, the sky isn't going to fall if that happens right yeah I don't believe so um, so then it's a, <clears throat> one of the things that we do know in a number of states is to access your MLS you must be a member of the realtor organization. 
But there are four states in particular and others voluntarily where it's been this way for years where you do not have to join your local association of realtors. You don't have to be a realtor to access your MLS. So since 1978 in California, if you've got a real estate license and you do have to have a real estate license or be an appraiser, but if you had a real estate license, you could go join the MLS, the multiple listing service without joining the association of realtors since 1978. And that's in the state of California. There are uh, three other states because of another uh, settlement, um, Florida, Al Alabama, and Georgia, where you don't need to be a realtor to access the MLS. And yet in these four states, we still have a lot of realtors. Yep. As a matter of fact, in Florida, you have, and in California, you have a couple hundred thousand. Yeah, in right. Eight, right. 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 And so people say, oh, if you don't have to join the realtor organization or if you, to be join the MLS and nobody's going to join the realtor organization. Well, I don't believe that because I've been a real estate broker in California for like 48 years. And, uh, you know, we've always had this situation or since as long as I can remember just about where you don't have to join the association. And yet people join the association. Right. Why? Because they find value. Absolutely, they find value. I thank you, Saul, for highlighting that because that's a that's a really that was a big issue that I ran into different people that they were worried about, and I I think that really helped clear clears the air about that. That's good. Well, you are who you're with, and it's a it's a group of people dedicating to learning and doing better in a code of ethics. And while leadership may be changing, and it probably changed in '96, and as things evolve, it will continue to change. The core beliefs are there. The foundational value well, we so all abide by. So if you go back to like 1900, um, when there was no MLS. And no big book in 1900. And there were no license laws. Yeah. And so what people who sold real estate were scoundrels. People who sold real estate that would take net listings. I'll list it for 100,000. I'll sell it for 300,000. I'll keep 200,000 and give wow. you one. Or I'll get an option to buy this property. And, and there were no license laws. And that's, and so, People who sold real estate had a bad reputation. And so certain groups of people decided they want to professionalize it. And they figured out what you need to professionalize it is number one, you need a code of ethics. So they created from the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges was created the National Association of Realtors. And they think you need to have a code of ethics and you need to have a listing service. And then if you have a listing service, it needs to be with exclusive listings and not open listings. And then if you have exclusive listings as opposed to open listings and open listings and non exclusive listing to many people, then you're going to have somebody working for you specifically. If you've got a listing service and everybody joins the listing service. Now, if you're a consumer, you can list your property with one broker and everybody gets to see it. If you're a buyer, you go out to one broker and you get to see everything contrary and so that's the way it works here and we take it for granted it's a great way now i just got back from paris as Andreas mentioned it was the this international mls forum the first international uh, mls forum it was sponsored by reso which is the real estate standards organization and cepi which is the kind of like the nar not really but that's what they got the nar of of Europe, CEPI, they sponsored this thing. And in Europe, they don't, for the most part, in a couple of places they do, they don't have MLS. And then and they don't have MLS for a number of reasons. One is they don't have exclusive listings. And so most of it is open listing. And so the first day of the conference were people in Europe talking about real estate practices in Europe. And the wow. second day were people to talk about the way we do it in North America, because in North America, the United States and Canada, we have MLS. And we have exclusive listings. As a matter of fact, Brad Inman of Inman News, he kicked off the conference by telling us how he how frustrating it was to buy his current home in Paris. And without so, the MLS. Without an MLS. Point. Because if you sellers list, they list with a number of brokers. Why? If they only list with one broker, nobody will show their property. So they have to list with a lot of brokers so they get the exposure. And then if you're a buyer, if you want to see a lot of property, you have to go to a lot of individual brokers because the br brokers won't show other brokers listings. And so everything is siloed. And then the, the portals, they can't get the information from an MLS where it's clean, it's policed. 
And so updated and updated the portal full of fake listings, outdated mm -hmm. listings. They're really lead generation. Oh, yeah, it's bait and switch. No, oh, that, that property sold, but I've got oh. another one you'd be interested in. And so it's just amazing the difference. And yet here we are in this country, right, where we use exclusive listings. People challenge, what's the benefit of an exclusive list? Well, if it's exclusive, it goes in the MLS. It's updated. It's policed. You only need to associate with one uh, broker to list your property. You get maximum exposure. If you're a buyer, you only have to see one uh, broker or agent and you get to see everything that's in the MLS. So huge advantages that they don't have anywhere else in the world. So quick caveat there. That's the assumption that it is, in fact, going on the MLS because residential, most, if not all, ends up in the MLS. But commercial in some states doesn't. 28 other listing platforms, like you said, they're not policed. It's outdated. It's lead gen, but they do so exist. Another essential element of an MLS is that you have to put all your listings in the MLS. You have to put them all in. You, you don't have to syndicate them all out. You can you choose to not display. Or no, not you share. have to in resident in residential MLS. You have to put them all in oh. because if you did, and this is why commercial MLSs fail. Commercial MLSs fail because you don't have to put all your listings in. If you don't have to put all your listings in, you put your schlock stuff in there. The only stuff you'll put in there is stuff you can't sell. And so what happens when you seek, and we used to have, a, we do have a commercial MLS, but there's, and you can make deals out of what's in there, but know that it's the junk. And so if you really want all of us as competitors to cooperate with one another, you make us put all our listings in. And so now we got to put the good in the bad. And if we're all confident that we'll all put the good in with the bad, that makes the system work. And so a critical element for the success of MLS is you have to put in all of your listing. That's why there was all this controversy over, over uh, coming soon. In a hot market, people wanted to withhold the good listings so they could what? Sell them themselves. Yeah. Dual agent. And by the way, in Europe, you got a lot of dual agency too, because nobody's going to represent you if they there's no way that they can be compensated. So you go to the listing agent, so the listing agent represents both sides. So a lot of detriment. So so is, so is there a co-star is there a co-star in uh, in Europe? You know, CoStar has a presence there. I don't remember the name of the company, but they just bought a portal in uh, in Great Britain, I believe. So yes, they have they have an uh, an idea of going worldwide. And and wow. And so I kind of see the there's a the, these people that want MLS in Europe, they're like they have to be. They're they they love the concept of MLS and they see the benefit and they want to take it to everybody else. And, and so it's not going to be easy to get MLS because you got special interests, right? People who want to maintain and keep things siloed and their keep their own business. So, um, but some of the big, the big uh, portals are co-star for one, they, they see the advantage and they understand this. Now, the one thing that you're going to need to make this work are technology are two things technology standards and and data standards so we, you know one of the problems that we had in this country with mls we didn't build it on any type of standard and so you had all these mls to speak in different languages and then when technology came along it made it difficult to build technology solutions that worked outside of one mls from one mls and it makes it very expensive to develop software so you need this you need a standard and that's what reso does the real estate standards organization and so they're you know pretty much in this country now we we've got mls's working on a standard and it's wonderful and then so now and we used to ask this question if you could build mls all over again what would you do differently and that's the opportunity they have in Europe and the rest of the world. And the first thing we got to say to them is you begin with standards and not only with the technology standards, but cultural standards, representation, code of ethics, exclusive listings. And these things are not things necessarily that people adopt overnight. And it's going to take a real, that's why I say the people that, that came to this meeting, they're kind of fanatical. They're wonderful because they see the benefits of MLS. And I believe MLS is a miracle and it just creates more op. It makes it think about real estate in this country. It's like almost liquid, right? You put it on the market and within a short period of time, you can turn it into cash. Well, in the rest of the world, it doesn't work like that. So there are a lot of other 
was like the here in the Chicagoland area, you have MRED. Was MRED out there with you, or were there a lot of other MLSs around? You know, MRED was not there, but Stellar MLS was there, which was a major MLS in Florida. So Mary Jo Callen, the CEO of Stellar, and a couple other very senior staff people from Stellar MLS were there. So there, and I'm, there are people that understand and see that at some point in time, you're going to have a a worldwide real estate uh, industry. Right. And it's just, it will grow to that over time. And right now in North America, we have pretty much got this. And, and, and by the way, we made a lot of mistakes to get to where we are. And th that was one of the, one of the my points and others points to the people in Europe was you can benefit from our mistakes. Yeah. It's, and we're not there to tell you that the, the, the American way is the right way. We're, we're here to help you do what you want to do, telling you what we did right and what we did wrong right. so you can learn from it. Maybe you can build your MLS in Europe faster than the 140 years it's taken us to build ours here in North America. And hopefully 140 more for commercial. Because it's let's be honest, there's still so much not on on the MLS commercial, well, I, and then it's not going to be on because you have independence, you have brokers, you have I an do. opaque industry. Go ahead, Saul. Oh, I, yeah. I want to take a point of personal privilege. Just one of the two things that, that Saul said is the history is a big deal. So I'm. Uh, it's interesting. Illinois is had so is kind of where a lot of the the National Association of Realtors obviously uh, get started and. I'm the, as an example, I'm the 132nd president of the Chicago Association of Realtors. So, I mean, it's been around a long time. And then another really cool part of Illinois, besides having Abraham Lincoln, uh, Brad Inman uh, was born and raised in Carlinville, Illinois. And Carlinville is south of Springfield. His parents ran a very, uh, a, a boutique woman's uh, dress shop. And, uh, and he's, cut, I mean, it just, it's the American dream. I mean, really, if you think about it, Brad Inman, didn't come for much and boy oh boy he's a big success i i hats off to brad Inman. yeah we've been friends since uh we're we're arguing about it i say 38 years he says 40 years and wow. uh, yeah he invited a, a group of us out to his home in paris which we, again we got the story about how difficult it was to find and it's right across the street from the parliament building and so out in front of and it's real interesting to get into the, his house, like you don't know that there are houses behind these big doors. And so the Uber dropped me off and I said, well, out in the, in, in the street were all these people with machine guns because it was right across the street from the parliament, right? So it's like high security. And then I did find the, you know, the push, the, the buttons to get into his place. And, and it was, uh, it's amazing. Three bedrooms built in like 1845. <laughs> And um, yeah, Brad's done amazingly well over the years. He's a very controversial figure, and um, but always looking to uh, to progress, right? To move the industry forward one way or another. And so we had we had a good time reminiscing, talking about the old days. That's fantastic. Speaking of amazingly well, uh, Becca's company, Carlson Integrated, awarded women women known business status. Was it? You just came out and got yeah. that. Yeah, it's been an exciting WBE journey. And WBE, that was it. So we, we've been a WBE with the city of Chicago and then uh, went for the national status through WeBank, which is a women-owned small business, is WOSB. And so we've been awarded that, which puts us at um, women and minority-owned business status, which will be beneficial as we're looking at any bid opportunities with big like big business it can be advantageous and it is a huge process i have a number of clients that are women and minority owned businesses and watching them go through this process and then having gone through it myself i have so much respect for people who are willing to you know basically undress and give everything about their company to a bunch of strangers and hope to be awarded with status as a, as a result it's a it's very harrowing and it's a long process it took seven, eight months. So it's it's not a it's not a quick thing and it's something that has to be regularly reported in and upkeep. I love transparency though, so it works really well. And we're I it, it's me and I have 14 women on my team. So it's not just women owned. We're actually like a, a an all women company. Not because I wouldn't like other people who are not women, but they don't seem to show up. I don't really get it. But um, 
<laughs> well, so like, leadership at the associations, women on business, ways to grow, right? These are all paths. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, you were jumping in. Go ahead. Or back. Sorry. No, it is really exciting. And thank you for acknowledging it, Andreas, because it takes yeah. uh, a lot of work to get to this point. Well, they're all past presidents or current presidents of associations outside of me here on the call. You guys have all done both, right? You've gone through regulation. You've gone through uh, business building. You've all been mentors. We've all been mentors. We've all been instructors here in, in one form or another. And it's it's ways to grow. And all of which are contact sports. Like you just said, you have to get in and show your books. You can't work in a silo or, or as some still do overseas, under uh, behind closed doors. To be out there and, and, and out there moving. So I, I will ask you: Did did uh, people talk about the insanity of American politics while you were out there? You know, there was a little bit of talk about that, not a whole lot. Okay. 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 And uh, they're polite. And, and you know, so it was conversation around how Parisians are different and how they take things a little bit, uh, not quite as intense. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what they're saying, right? Uh, but you know, it's, you know, cause it's crazy here, but it's probably yeah. always been crazy here. It, 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 it always has been crazy. Yeah. People want to say, Oh, I can't believe this. I mean, I think the internet and social media just makes it people more aware, but it's always been nuts. I mean, I mean, Alexander Hamilton was uh, shot by Eric Burr. Yeah, he should be ghouls. <laughs> right. Ghouls. Yeah. I mean, it's like, good Lord. But yeah, it's, it's always been crazy, but I, I would, I would highlight though, um, I was with uh, Kevin McCarthy on Monday for lunch. Um, my wife uh, does different events, and she she had him in for a big uh, holiday event with some different people. And so we were talking to him, and my question to him was, um, and he's announced that he's going to resign from his position in January one, I believe. But my question to him is, what you know, what do we expect in the future of uh, you know the ten thirty one and what's going to happen with tax reform in 2025. And especially you have uh, people who are talking about uh, wanting to mark to mark securities and to pay uh, tax on, on phantom income. And he really highlighted to me, he's like, well, that whole phantom income thing is being discussed. And, and I, I saw it the next day in the wall street journal that the, uh, the U S Supreme court has taken that up as a big discussion point of how, of, of how you can uh, tax, um, unrealized gain and is that is that something that's taxable so that's a big thing for people to be aware of uh, in uh, the future and if, uh, i recommend everybody to uh, to check out the wall street journal um, i get the wall street journal every day and uh, in my opinion it's the best the best thing we could read it has the most in-depth they still have money and they have reporters um your local papers are you know that they just aren't they don't have the resources that the Wall Street Journal does. So um, it, it's a really important periodical to read. So I, you know, along the same lines of, you know, economics and taxes, I was uh, participated in a phone call last Wednesday from the airport and again this morning where um, the think tank that I uh, participate in weekly believes that there's going to be 2,000 to 2,500 bank failures next year. And if not next year, because it's an election year, the following year, dramatic, back to the days of the RTC or 2008, we're back to where we were major meltdown and something that the our institutions really are not going to be able to handle. We're going to need more private capital to do it. Now, why? Uh, primarily local and regional banks has to do with construction financing at the local and regional level. The fact that interest rates take out financing rates have gone up. Buildings that once pencil don't pencil. The fact that people are working, all of these things are going to cause over 2,000 bank failures. And that's going to create, to go back to Andreas's point, huge opportunities. That's right. For certain, right. For certain people. Right. And so, yeah. And the, where's a great place to learn about these things as they happen? The Wall Street Journal is a great publication. Right. Well, I, so I, I have this uh, document from the uh, Congressional Research Service. And I'll just read you one of the paragraphs in it um, that I, I got for tonight. Um, CRE and the economy. And just like what Saul said, the CRE industry relies heavily upon borrowing. So tightening credit conditions 
or the devaluing of commercial property used as collateral can affect the ability of builders to obtain financing for new construction. Higher, higher borrowing costs can reduce CRE growth or increase rents for CRE occupants. In turn, losses in CRE can affect those individuals and institutions that finance CRE, which is obviously Saul's point, potentially causing further further ripple effects on the economy. So um, this is a it's a it is absolutely Saul. It's a big deal <laughs> coming down the pike. Yeah, big, big. As, as big as it is, there are those preparing for it, and capital sitting on the sideline, right? So while I'm not just going to jump to private equity because I like brokers and I like sales, private equities there there's there is pain, but at the opposite of pain is the opportunity to take this decline on these assets and, and give them rebirth, redevelop, repurpose. But yes, there's just pain. I, and nobody's denying it. It's just a question of how do you be of service and in service with your clients, right? Inland is still buying. Yeah. Companies like Inland, I mean, our, you know, Joe Kassenz, all, all of our top leaders, I mean, they're, they're not, luckily they have the money um, and they're just holding off and waiting to get those incredible deals that are going to happen. And so it's just, yeah. Having those experienced people uh, who've been around, I mean, Inland's been around for 56 years, um, just knowing the right time to, to get something is a big deal. So, yeah, it's it's important. But we, again, we go back to the power of NAR, and I'm telling you that having the, the members, that we have 1.5 million members, we have all of these people that are, are related to each congressman and senator, that kind of network is just invaluable. And I'm praying to God that that's not going to be diminished in any way because we uh, do have the power of uh, the, behind us and all the you know, real estate roundtable. Everybody looks to the realtors because of our massive um, strength that um, we, we don't want to see that diminish. So um, we're doing everything we can here as a company to, to support NAR and support all of our associations and whatever we can do. But we need to be together. Otherwise, uh, if, if you're not together, oh, my gosh, it's a scary thing. Well, and well, so the, the problems in the commercial space will spill over into the residential space. Absolutely. Right? absolutely. That's inevitable. So it's not like just confined to the commercial side. This is going to have a major effect as well on the residential side. And then how is that going to be handled? Where are the opportunities people are going to have? And there will be, but it's going to be. Um, it's not going to be as easy as as we think it might be. And again, we need organizations like NAR, like our state associations, like our local associations to help fight for the things that we know will make it better because there are interests that are pushing us the other way. Saul, could you drill down a little bit? Because I really like what you just brought up. Could you drill down just to talk about how directly the, the residential would, would be impacted so people understand that? Yeah, well, so if you look at the commercial real estate and you look at the fact that uh, and some of this has to do with COVID and the people, fact that people are working from home and the uh, the fact that people who own commercial real or who lease commercial real estate might not be renewing their leases or are walking away from their leases. And then that affects the people that have financed it. And then how many people need to live in that particular area who might work in those commercial areas. And so there's this effect. You really need to start taking a unified view of real estate. It's not industrial, it's separate from commercial, it's separate from residential. We know this intuitively. They all depend on one another. And right. so as one happens to be affected, it's going to have effect on the others. And right. so those people that figure that out and watch for that are going to have, uh, have an advantage in finding the opportunities that Andreas talks about because they're paying attention to this broader market that's not. And so for us in residential real estate, it's not like we we can say, well, it's not us, it's the commercial side. No, it's- Oh it's no, I say it all the time. It's not the commercial, the residential is gonna slow down, but commercial is still gotta, still gotta move a bit faster, I should say. If I'm, yeah. if I'm in a home, I can stay here. I can just gut through this. But if I'm a business that's struggling, to your point, I have to get smaller or else I fail and then I'm gone and then um, vacant and that vacancy goes to the owner and so on and so forth. And then those employees have to sell. Well, so this spreads into a whole nother area that kind of is related. And that is that there isn't enough to sell. And the reason <laughs> the <residential laughs> yeah. is there, isn't enough to, there isn't enough to sell is because right. we have restrictions on building. 
And so our inventories are low for a number of reasons. And one of them is we can't build. And one of the reasons we can't build is they want us to build closer together instead of farther apart. One of the reasons they want us to build closer together is because they don't want people driving because there's an environment. There's all these issues that kind of tie in. And then people who have low interest rates on their loans, they don't want to move because they have to give up the interest rate on their loan. So then there's no inventory feeding into the market for that natural moving up in the residential space. And then there's the compensation side of real estate, where now we're talking about should the seller be allowed to pay the compensation to the person that represents the buyer and what if that goes away? And so dramatic changes. And again, will it happen in 2015? 24 or will it wait till after the election year to really have a major impact and that's yet to be determined but i think some things we're going to start seeing things going south here um end of first quarter next year and but again that always creates opportunity for people who are ready right and noise and the noise will reduce in the industry there are a lot of people that got into this industry when it was very easy in the last two years COVID notwithstanding that are not going to be here. They're not used to working hard. They haven't been through a dip, a recession, a, a uh, cycle. And this is the cycle. And it will, in fact, go up and it will go down. It's just the way of the industry. Well, Earth, it, death, and so on. Yeah, yeah, part of the issue with, with real estate compensation, and, and Dan, you mentioned it, is that attorneys charge 30% to 50% of what they earn. Because they, right. when, they work on, when they work on contingency, Right. They work on contingency. Well, real estate is a contingency based compensation structure and people forget to talk about that. So realtors, people who sell real estate don't get paid unless the deal closes. It's contingency. And so five or six percent to me is a heck of a deal. When you look at what the attorneys charge when they're absolutely. Contingency, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. I like it as a negotiation t tactic. Uh, certainly five to six percent. We charge six. But, but we're worth it, right? You don't discount, you don't bargain shop for your brain surgeon. And I consider commercial brokers, brain surgeons, residential agents and brokers, heart surgeons. These are the biggest things, the most important things in your life outside of your health and family, your assets, right? Most expensive. Why would you discount shop? And, I, yeah, and I, Andreas, I don't think we're supposed to talk about commissions of what you. <laughs> I didn't talk about commissions. Everyone else has said commissions. By the okay. way, we also charge consulting we're not fees, hourly. There's more than success. Okay. Uh, based fees out there, right? Yeah, so you look at, at the, the fact that real estate commissions are, are a contingency based. You don't get paid unless you close something, oh. right? Yeah, so that's sorry. Not, that's Did I say never, six? I meant some random number. Thank that's you. Never very very well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's never very efficient. And when you look at the amount that people pay, now that could all change because of the 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 job descriptions. That's another thing people don't talk about. What's the job description of the person who sells real estate five years from now? She What's the job over. description? Right. So, and then you hear sell, sellers are now saying because of this litigation, I, I don't want to pay. This is the whole basis of the litigation. I don't want to pay the person who represents my opponent. I don't want to be, I don't want to pay that person. What's the benefit in me paying the person who represents my opponent? And the answer is, they're going to bring you more qualified buyers. They're going to jump through all the hoops to make sure the people that they bring to you are people who can actually afford to buy your property. You know, it's not easy to buy a piece of real estate, at least in California. You look at the number of contracts and disclosures that need to take place. When somebody works with the buyer, they're going to bring you, they're going to do all that work for you. If your agent has to do that work, then remember they're your agent. And as your agent, you are responsible for acts of that agent when those acts are performed within the scope of authority. And so you could end up as a seller being sued because of something your agent does as they represent the other. You want the buyer to be represented in a real estate transaction for a number of reasons. One is, is um, liability reasons. So there's a lot of this conversation hasn't been had in a long time. And so I think that with the litigation, people are going to have to start talking about this again. Otherwise, consumers are led down a false path, which is exactly, it seems like, what happened in the Sitzer case in Missouri, where the jury was led down the wrong path. And so, so Becca, what do you, you obviously are out there every day. 
Um, what do you think, I mean, in your experience, what do you think uh, about all that? It's been interesting to me to observe the behaviors and the perspectives of brokers, residential and commercial. I have clients that are both investors and owners. I have clients that are both. I have clients that are serving and providing professional services to every aspect of the real estate transaction, third party property management, insurance, literally everything that you can imagine. Attorneys, we get to work with the overarching positives of our industry to me significantly outweigh the negatives. And because my experience is primarily in the commercial sector where we do have set commission, like we have those commission conversations in advance and, and everybody's represented. I expect everybody to be represented. If I talk to somebody who doesn't have an attorney, I don't actually want to talk to them. If they're raising investment funds, for instance, and they say, hey, I want to raise a fund. I say, great, who's your attorney? And if they don't have one yet, I say, you shouldn't take people's money. You can't take people's money. You're not represented. It's that same concept of ensuring representation, of ensuring professionalism within the industry. And that has been so critical. And I may or may not appropriately be applying that to residential because I'm not as knowledgeable in that field. But to me, it's the same thing. Everyone should have professional representation and professional advisors when they're making a huge business transaction. And whether you like it or not, your house is your biggest business transaction of your life. So let's think about that and build that into a process. I, I have so much hope. I have so much hope for our industry. And I love Saul bringing us back to that conversation of how it started and the original conversations. And then how we protect consumers by ensuring representation and ensuring transparency. To me, it's there. there's every element of win-win-win in the conversation as long as we have the conversations. As long when it's antagonistic in a courtroom type setting where people are trying to get, have an agenda to get a certain result out of it, in that case, a lot of money, it doesn't open up the conversations that we need really need to have, I guess, is my point. Well, it's, it's, it's saving a nickel to, which costs you a dime. That's the conversation. Everybody I know who's a, who's a major player is happy to pay brokerage fees, both sides, the whole fee, whatever it may be, because it's of service and it's valuable. And last, I, last I heard from the residential side, a homeowner that tries to do it without a broker is 18, 19% off on his value. And add to that that the MLS, on average, at least in our market, shows 130% above asking. I mean, that's 40% that a homeowner who tries to do it on their own doesn't see, doesn't get, doesn't know about. They lose it. That's saving a nickel, costing a dime, pure and simple. Hey, for professionals. I looked at a, a technology and a concept <clears throat> when I was in Paris um, where... If you, and so here's the premise. When somebody represents a buyer under the current paradigm, they actually are rewarded for buying, making the buyer pay more. So the more that the buyer pays for the property, we all know this, right? Then the higher the amount of money that the person who represents the buyer earns. That's in America too, though, right? No, the that's more... what I'm saying. No, no, I, exactly. That is it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so... The, this construct, and maybe there is something wrong with the construct of the way in which we transact real estate. And maybe we need to look at the creation of a model that pays people for what they accomplish and for acting in your best interest. And so perhaps, and there's all kinds of caveats to this, but what if the person who represented the buyer, if the buyer said, look, here's the property, I found this property, they want this much, I think that I'm willing to pay a certain amount. And then I'm looking for an agent who can get it for me for less. And if you get it for me for less, then I'll allow you to have some percentage of the gap between what I'm willing to pay and what you can end up negotiating for me. So a net listing in reverse on the buy side. Kind of, but not really. Right. Kind of, but not really, because it's on the gap. Yeah, actually, now, if I represent the buyer, if I can get you a better price, it's in your best interest. 
You want isn't that your fiduciary responsibility, regardless of what your compensation is? It is, but that doesn't mean that's what happens. That's the issue. <laughs> the way that yeah. the way that the structure is set up, the best interest of the buyer consumers, not necessarily the best interest of the buyer agent. Is there a way you could restrict? And yes, there are plenty of professional people that say, I'll do it for nothing because it's my fiduciary duty to get you the very best price. And if I have to throw my commission in to get rid well, We didn't go that far. Let's back oh, up. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah, no, 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 no. no. Oh, uh, so there are. Yeah. But that's not to say because of the nature of the industry, you know, contingency-based uh, compensation and independent contractors that mm -hmm. there are not situations where it doesn't necessarily work out in the best interest of the buyer. And so is there a way to structure, this, this was the idea, to structure commission on the buy side so that the person who represents the buyer is directly compensated for the amount of benefit brought to the buyer? Because that's not the current structure. Yeah, bonus for, bonus for how far under the list price you can get. Kind of, example, yeah. Sort of. Uh, and we're at the top of the hour. We raced through that. The It's an interesting world, right? We're going to have to each fight for our fair share. Uh, to date, anyone I've offered to pay me hourly at my rate has always gone for the success fee. So I think that will continue. Uh, you say what? Do they accept the hourly? And, and, and no, one, no one ever chooses, I'll pay you hourly at my yeah, rate. Yeah, no, me either. I've done that. And I say, here, because you, you're going to owe me whether we close or not. Yeah, right. That's right. And then they say, oh, no, I think I'll go with the regular way. Yeah. So um, real quick, it's it's the end of the year. What's the one tip you want to give our audience of over 3,000 monthly now, tune-ins and downloads for next year as they head into the season? Let's go around, wish them all well for the holiday. Salt's to my right. Yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you... Uh, happen to celebrate. Don't forget celebrate to pay, pay well. your dues. <laughs> yeah, to pay your dues to your local association, your state association, and the national association of realtors. And look for the opportunity. And as Dan said, read the Wall Street Journal or something comparable to that. Know about what's going on. Be aware, and then you'll see the opportunities when they're there because they will. They will. There will be. We've been through this before, one way or another. We've seen it. So um, I'd say be optimistic. And the best way to be optimistic is to be informed. And so start out the year being informed. Well said. I'm going to go with Rebecca. You're, you're in the right assault. Well, I appreciated your comment earlier, Andreas, about real estate being a contact sport. Stay in contact with people. As we end this year, whether it's holiday parties, whether it's looking at your schedule for the coming year, we all grow and our industry sectors are interdependent. Make mm -hmm. sure you're staying in contact with your prior contacts and make new friends. Dan over oh, next. So again, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Uh, appreciate all of you. I will, uh, I will tell you that before this show, Andrea said that if each one of you, 3000 people, get another person to watch or to listen and watch he'll give each one of you a candy cane so <laughs> make sure make sure you get we'll be at six thousand. <laughs> oh boy that's I, they have plus postage there but yeah, yes plus postage, uh, that's what you have to do but, no, the, uh, again the, the big thing is we, we are all blessed to uh to wake up every day and to have this incredible country where we can do uh, real estate in, any, in the best way we can. And we're part of the National Association of Realtors. And um, I'm, I'm blessed to, that Saul Klein is my friend. Andreas is my friend. Becca, uh, thank you guys so much. And, and all of you listening, uh, we're all in this together. We're on this earth at this certain point in time. And uh, we all have to work together. And let's try to do that more. Hey, let me give something to Becca. This is something that I love. Contacts create contracts. Ooh, love that. Oh, that is good. Yeah, network equals net worth and contacts create contracts. I'll, I'll go with that all day. The um, my, my parting bit, as I see more and more chat GPT, and I've been fact checked now with chat GPT, is we're going into a period where people will have a lot of questions because they've never been through it before. 
The answer is not to ask ChatGPT. It's to ask your leadership. And if you don't have leadership in front of you in your organization, to go up to NAR, go to a bigger group where there's leadership to ask, hey, how does this work? What do I do now? The worst thing you can do is fall into a trap and get into an echo chamber online and think you're headed down the right path. When in fact, people will, if you ask them, they will help you. I've asked each of you for something at some point and you, we all jump to help each other. It's in our nature, especially around the holidays. So with that, don't forget to tune in every month, first Thursday of the month. The roundtable is available everywhere you get your audio and videos, podcasts, videocasts, whatever. Replays on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Please do share, rate, and review us. It really does help. And we really may send out some candy canes, or I may bulk mail them to Dan's house every day for the next 30 days. <laughs> uh, we will see. Um, thank you again for tuning in. Please do come back next month. Leave us a comment. I want to give a special shout out to Adam. Dugan, who sent in a long comment, and we're going to address that on NAR Solutions, uh, but offline, so we don't keep going, because we could keep going, let's be honest. Thank you to Mr. Mendoza, our show producer, for all he does. Thank you to my co-hosts. I'm grateful for you. Hope you have a great holiday rest of the year, a happy new year. And to our audience, can't wait to see you in 2024. Getting it done in 2024. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Real Estate Roundtable, powered by Crackle AI, your source for the latest in real estate and technology. For past episodes, sector interviews, and more great content, follow us on all social media and YouTube at CRE Collaborative. You can also find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Please like, subscribe, and share. It really does help. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you at the next Real Estate Roundtable.